there's always that one person who you want to meet and you'd be like, this is never going to happen. And then this guy shows up at your door. I'm bartending outside on the patio and I get a text message. We're just about to sit down for dinner. Knock on the door. I'm a wedding photographer and I get ready to photograph. And as I look through the lens, I see this guy. We were having a house party and I run inside, close the door. I was like, shh, you're not going to believe it. Bill Murray's here. <sighs> Welcome one and all to another TMG interview here with the movie guys talking movies with those who make them. Paul Preston here, along with Karen Volpe, who, as you know, is a huge Bill Murray fan. Well, Karen is in luck, and you all are, because our guest today is a filmmaker whose newest project is a documentary about just what you heard in that clip at the top of the show, the legendary stories of Bill Murray out and about in society creating and expanding his mythic personality. It's called The Bill Murray Stories, and in studio we have the director, Tommy Avalone. Oh, whoa. Lovely sound effects. I just want to correct you real quick. Please do. Bill Murray Stories, Life Lessons Learned from a Mythical Man. I was going to say, that is the <laughs> that is the subtitle, uh, more or less, of Full it. title. Full, Full title. title. No yeah. colon? Oh, there's a call. Oh, there's a call. Right, there you go. But, but please explain then anything that I left out from that description because, you know, this is a feature film. There's a lot to, to cover with Bill Murray's exceptional, you know, personality out there with the urban legends. So what are we going to see when we see this film? Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, all in the trailer. We, we went to all these different cities and interviewed all these different people who've had these Bill Murray stories, the karaoke, the played kickball, uh, did your dishes at a party. Like, we went to all these different places, South Carolina, London, um, Scotland. Uh, did I say Chicago? Uh, South Carolina. Well, you got to go to Austin. Chicago if it's anything yeah. Bill Murray. And we, we, we put all these stories in one movie, and there's a, you know, decent story that follows you through. I'm not a pitch man. I just make the movies. <laughs> no, no actually, that, that's really a great description because a lot of the things... I actually hate pitching. <laughs> oh, well, that, uh, there you go. You did a great job. Then there for hating go. it, I wouldn't have yeah. known. I wouldn't because have known. you don't want to give away any of, uh, too much about any of the stories because that's what I love the most about watching it yeah. is I know all the stories. I've heard them as much as anyone else has, but to go and get to hear what the people felt when they were interacting with Bill, I thought that was a great angle and I really liked that the most. Yeah, our approach was, you know... Um, I wanted to make this movie about Bill Murray's stories. And if we were to make it like a Bigfoot documentary, like a detective novels, I, I do hear the planes now. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think I was going to. We call to. Our, our studio the Admiral's Club okay. because we're so close to the airport. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be there. Uh, well, anyway, so yeah, but if we, we our, our approach was, you know, Bill Murray's real, but these stories are questionable. So it's like you're making a Bigfoot documentary. So that was like our mindset the whole time. Yeah, Karen's right. I mean, you read about this in the in the paper, and you always get excited. Oh, he showed up at a construction site, and he did right. blah, blah, blah. But you never get the emotional reaction of the person on the other end. You'll read in print, he was funny or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But it's great to see how he changes lives. Yeah, there's a smile on everyone's face that talks about Bill Murray. Yeah, and you kind of want to be like him, and it seems like it's, I don't know, it almost seems like it's more daunting the more you uh, explore it, because... It's you know you get so bogged down with cynicism and your day to day admin and your things you have to do in your life and it seems like he's just freewheeling it and you just want to be like that. You have to practice. You know, it's like uh, there's a little bit of audio in the movie where he talks about. Uh, you know, Bill's not in the movie, but we you know we were able to use some of these interviews from uh, Rolling Stone from Gavin Edwards, and he talks about you know uh, being asleep at the wheel, you know, and trying to do things to wake himself up. You know, a couple days in a row he'll be like asleep and just. You know, actively trying to wake himself up. Yeah, and it, I guess it, I guess he doesn't opt for jumping out of a plane or whatever to sort of. He has jumped out of a plane. Oh, yeah? so, <laughs> okay. It seems like he just like interacts with people, yeah, and those not, are the ones who give him life. seeking. You know, yeah. it's like just to like when I say waking up, it's like to be here, uh, like in this particular moment, not just like being worried about tomorrow or thinking about that thing that happened earlier. It's just like currently here now. And that's something I think he's been doing his whole life. The Razor's Edge is a perfect example of that. That movie is about being in the moment. Yeah, I was so surprised. I mean, I'm not sure if you're listening or watching this, but that you got a uh, Razor's Edge poster. I've never seen that before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that came to me just because it was supposed to, I guess. I, yeah. I got it in a very strange way. But I uh, love Ghostbusters. That was my 
Well, that wasn't my first interaction with seeing Bill Murray. I saw him on Saturday Night Live, of course, and I fell in love with him there. And I was very little, but I just knew that I loved him, and I, of course, loved Gilda Radner. But then whenever I saw Ghostbusters, it was such an important part of my, of my life. It changed my life to see Ghostbusters. So then I started watching everything else that he had done. Right. But, yeah, I can't Ghostbusters believe... Ghostbusters is great. I, it's my favorite movie. It made a huge difference to me. I feel like it was like the 25th anniversary of something. Like it went back into the theaters, and I was actually I got to see it in the theater, and I was surprised about like, oh, this is funny. You know, like oh, you, you forget how funny it is. And somehow you watch other movies from 1984, and you'll be like, ooh, that movie's stuck in the 80s. Ghostbusters, outside of some questionable sure. special effects, which you let go because that's not why you're watching the, the special movie. Special effects are phenomenal. They are, but <laughs> you see, you know, like the dog is clearly, you know, not blended well with the background or whatever, and this uh, or that the scene. Terror dog, but. Doesn't matter because that's not why you're watching the movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, we had Mr. Stay Puffed in here, the uh, puppeteer who did we Mr. Stay Puffed. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, that was pretty badass. That's, that's awesome. Cool. William yeah. Bryan. Yeah, yeah, there's an actor in that thing, and lo and behold, he's working a bunch, and he came and talked about it. <laughs> you should talk to the Robin Shelby. I think she lives in Burbank. Oh, and who is that? Oh, she's she. Plays, oh, was she? She uh, played Slimer. Goes her. Oh, Slimer. oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> in the second one. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, we probably shouldn't stop doing this until we've had all the members of I Ghostbusters agree. in one form or another but in the our The ones in that wore costumes. Right. <laughs> yeah, just the costumes. We got to get that one skeleton I, that was driving the taxi. It'll be perfect. <laughs> get that guy in here. No, yeah. before we started um, our interview, you were talking about the a movie about Ghostbusters. You did a movie with um, stories? Yeah, I, 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 pr- uh, I produced and edited this movie called Ghost Heads. It's currently on Netflix. It played Tribeca. Um, and it was just about Ghostbuster fans. Like what, what you know, these fans that build proton packs and live have their whole life be Ghostbusters. Uh, there's Ghostbusters New Jersey. There's Los Angeles Ghostbusters. There's Ghostbuster groups all around the country. And Downey, the we've met them. Yeah, yeah. We, we hosted a screening of Ghostbusters here in Burbank, an outdoor screening, and we invited the SoCal okay. Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters, the South Bay Ghostbusters, I think, think they were. So. There's different factions, you know, and yeah. they all came out and they set up a table and they did yeah. photo ops and they just love it. They do a lot of stuff for charity, so we just kind of followed around a couple of the key... Um, um, Ghostbusters. I mean, you guys seen I Am Santa Claus, the movie I directed, but it was it was kind of like the same formula. It's like, okay, here's identity and passion to a good scale, to a bad scale, to a medium scale. Uh, but we were able to interview Dan Aykroyd, Sigourney Weaver, uh, Ray Parker Jr., uh, I'm, I'm Paul Feig, Ivan Reitman. So it was fun. Yeah, I mean, the, being a Ghostbusters fan, it was it was crazy. Like, you got a good handle on different entertainment niches. In society, is that the word niche? Niche, niche, in society. Nietzsche at this uh, yeah, point. Yeah, you Nietzsche's. You're you're like the Nietzsche of filmmaking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they get these little sort of subcultures between Ghostbuster fans, Bill Murray legends, yeah. real beard Santa Clauses. So you, I like kinda, following passion. You yeah. know, like in, you know, certain people that's are passionate. Well yeah, yeah. So. And, and thank you for doing that because we feel that in our our normal lives we have so many people that we interact with that don't just love the thing they love. Mm-hmm. And I think that it takes a lot of balls to say, I love this and I'm just going to be open with loving whatever that crazy thing is. And we do that and we get a great response from people because they see the joy in it. But at the same time, people sometimes are so afraid they're going to be picked on or they're going to be judged that they're afraid to lean into that. Sure. And I think that's what makes everybody have their own personalities and be special is loving what you love and not being afraid to. Yeah, I mean, in Ghostbusters, we did talk to a psychologist that uh, deals with cosplay stuff. You oh, know, and, and they talk about how like putting that suit on uh, it almost makes them feel more like themselves than not wearing the suit. Yeah. And particularly for Ghostbuster fans, it's really a group thing. And you're not playing, uh, um, uh, you know, Ray Stans. You're not playing Peter Vakeman. You're playing, you know, your person inside of that world. Like you're, it's a, it's a, it's a job. It's a uniform. So you actually get to be like almost a better version of yourself. Well, I have to tell you because I just don't want you to wonder what my deal was. So I <laughs> love Ghostbusters because, um, first of all, it's a great movie, super funny, and I'm just so thankful that was the movie that was playing when my dad had a really massive heart attack at 44, and I was just 14. So we lived way af- af- far away from the hospital, and so in order to get to the hospital, my mom would have to pack me and my brothers up into the car at like 7.30 in the morning because it was in the summer when this happened in June, and take us to the hospital, and then we would sit there all day. And there was nothing to do. And it took about 45 minutes each direction to get back and forth. So um, my dad had this heart attack. They thought he had passed away. It was really traumatic. I was very upset. So my mom came out. They were able to bring him back. And she's like, just take your sister somewhere and do something with her. So they went to the mall, of course, and Ghostbusters was playing. So we go in to see Ghostbusters. And before I know it, I totally forgot about this horrible thing that happened. And I 
was in this world with these people doing these jobs who were very normal and friends and they weren't great at really anything but they were tried and I loved that and there's something about that was so magical so then the show got over and they're like well now what do you want to do and I'm like I want to see it again (laughs) and so in the time my dad was in the hospital recovering from this getting a pacemaker and this whole horrible thing I saw it 10 times in the movie theater (laughs) and so it changed my life it was the thing that taught me that comedy can help you to hide yeah. from the world but also make it bearable and I also learned that these people working together and following their dreams can make things happen that not one of them by themselves could have make happen so it became this very philosophical way to approach life that changed for me because I was not that kind of thinker before I saw Ghostbusters 10 times in the theater but it taught me that I was able to deal with my dad being sick and still laugh at it and still find humor and I would come back and I would act it out to him and I would tell him all about the movie and it really made a huge difference. And it was cool because every time I meet a Ghostbuster, I get to tell them that story and I get to tell Bill Murray that story. Yeah, what's what's great about the stuff, it's never, the, the interesting questions are never what, it's why, you mm-hmm. know? And, you know, it's uh, it's interesting to me, having done a couple of these things with the Santa Clauses and the, the Ghostbusters, it's why, you know, um, when we follow in Ghost Heads, Tom Gephardt, who's a New Jersey Ghostbuster, uh, it wasn't because he liked proton packs or a Mm-mm. ghost. It was because uh, his his parents were divorced. And the only time, like, you know, he would go from his mom to his dad, but the person who helped raise him is more or less his grandparents. And whenever his, his grandfather and him would bond, they would put Ghostbusters on. Mm-hmm. So to him, to know how to bond was watching Ghostbusters. So it really helped kind of build and sculpt like the way he saw the world. Uh, this one lady, uh, she's a real bad alcoholic, and one day just started watching Ghostbusters over and over and over and kind of went from, like I don't want to say one addiction to the other, but in a positive way, yeah, it brought her out of yeah. drinking. I know? was just going to make that comparison when you talked about how Ghostbusters helped you bear, made the world bearable. I'm like, well, thank God it was these comedians as opposed to alcohol, because a lot of people right. will dip into that to make the world not so harsh. And then also thank God it was Ghostbusters and not like Mannequin. I know. I right? was thinking about that too. <laughs> <laughs> I actually heard a story where uh, Bill Murray was talking about John Prine. And John Prine did that for him because he was into a state of depression. And he one day just said, I think what we need is some John Prine. And he started listening to John Prine music over and over and over. And recently he went to the Grand Old Opry and sang with John, I believe. So, yeah, probably fulfilling his own sort of journey to, yeah. to get to the guy who changed him. That's wild. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Um, well, let's get back to, uh, let's continue on with Bill Murray's that, stories, because I wanted to ask if there were any... Well, that's a Bill Murray story. It is, yeah, so I know. there's always know. Bill Murray stories. Oh, and I've got another one for you. Yeah, but uh, it, it's were, were there any cool. you, you couldn't use? Uh, either people were tight-lipped about it, or it was not... It could be really personal, too, because, yeah. you know... There's like, you know, maybe one... Like story that they didn't still want to be on camera. They oh, just okay. they felt like they told the story enough, and they just didn't want that to be the first thing that came up when they go- their name got googled. You know, sort of. <laughs> thing. It wasn't anything crazy. You know, some people did feel like th- this is their story and they didn't want to share it, and that's whatever. The only story really that we filmed and cut from the movie was a fake story. It was um it was in 2012. It was the Bill Murray party crash party crashing tour. Uh, and this guy from Phoenix huh. made this flyer that said, Bill Murray will be in your town at this particular time. If you hang a sign that says, Bill Murray, please crash here, free beer, and a karaoke machine, uh, he, he might show up. They had an email. Uh, Karen's going to grab the sign that she put out in front yeah, of our house. Oh, my oh my God. This, <laughs> yeah, you did this? We have this, yeah. You, so you you done this? But yeah, I don't thought we were never expecting to come by, but it said, wouldn't it be funny if because we were doing, we were, Talking about in here a Bill Murray movie, so he said, "Let's stick that out front just to be just to have some fun." So okay, did. but are you familiar with this particular flyer? Uh, I think so. But Karen will have to tell you because I think her hearing about this was what prompted her to make the sign. Okay, so yeah, so this guy—it's all BS. Yeah, no, he yeah. lied. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, this guy actually went on to do a lot of fake news and not you know not the best things, but he did this this he started with this thing and it was it was interesting in that like people were having these parties like Phoenix, Philadelphia, Houston. Uh, everywhere we're, like, we're having these parties that he said and it was kind of cool in the sense where like people were, were just celebrating Bill and I just think in the, in the video version of this this is now there's no one <laughs> yeah, right, Karen, <laughs> like <left. if> <laughs> Karen went behind our studio is an actual garage so she went back there to look for a sign that uh, Bill Murray said oh uh, well there she is 
<laughs> but if they're fast forwarding right now and like seeing, they're like, oh, where did the <laughs> did she ever come back? Yeah. Please don't fast forward. Uh, no, it's all right. But yeah, I mean that was that was one of the stories that we cut out. Um, for a couple different reasons, the interview wasn't the best. He did fall asleep while we we're. Uh, he, he he was drinking a little bit that day, oh my God. Uh, and I, he fell asleep. It's the only time I ever had to like do one of these during the interview. Wow, that's really? amazing. Uh, yeah, uh, it's on the DVD. I don't think uh, we've had to do that quite yet. But uh, in here, that's amazing. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was the only thing we cut out. It was in there. We we followed around some of the people who, because to add to it, there was a uh, homeless guy he found that he would act as if that was Bill Murray's manager. Uh, so he would just show up. Wow! It was it was it wasn't the best thing in the world. So we, we didn't use it. That was probably smart. That's that's very strange. Yeah, if you could interview him from prison, that might have been an interesting interview. <laughs> I was thinking about but, making um, flags. Uh, you know how people hang flags out in front of their house that you can buy that say Bill Murray can crash here, and you can just hang it in front of your house. Yeah, there was a there was a place um, I don't even know what store it was, but in Portland that did that. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, I want to say the the subjects you have in the film are generally open and gregarious people. Yeah, they're fantastic. Like the, I was pretty, I love the I bartender. was pretty shocked that there weren't any celebrities. These are regular people, but the, uh, but uh, kudos to your direction or you or to just whoever found these people, or maybe they're the kind of people that Bill Murray's attracted to. But they were just open and fun to listen to and and natural on film. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, it was great to like you know find these people. It was is really interesting. We we filmed the movie like around 2015, 2016. It's a weird story. We started filming the movie uh, in 2015. We did the karaoke story and the kickball story, and we found these Ghostbuster fans. We're like, oh, we should interview them because um, we thought, oh, they, they're obviously big fans of Bill Murray. Found out that there's a documentary in Canada being made called Ghost Heads, uh, and there was like one thing led to another. We just kind of shifted gears, so I started producing that and came back to Bill Murray afterwards. Oh, and then by then, there's a tons more stories, no <laughs> doubt, right? Yeah, but, well, the thing, so, but the reason I mentioned the, um, the time is because like um, during that time, Facebook was an interesting thing where if you did not have a mutual friends with someone, uh, you couldn't directly message them. It would go into the other folder. And oh, no that's one, right. No one yeah. really checks the other folder. Right. So when these stories on you know, BillMurrayStory.com or Rolling Stone or GQ, whatever the stories were, Chive, um, they would have their names. So I would have to f- go on Facebook, find them, and then message them. But then if I didn't have a mutual friend, which was most of the most case. Most of the time. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would have to go through their friends and find like a band or a comedian or anyone that obviously was accepting anyone. You know, usually it's the, a weird default picture. It's right. never themselves, you know. So I'd have to do that and then then message the person. So Brilliant. That's yeah. smart. Yeah, so that's I, how we got them. I would say um, that you know, everybody has one of these stories. And we had Rhett Reese in here. Now, he wrote Deadpool. But he wrote Zombieland as well. Okay. So he started telling us about how to get Bill Murray. Because you bring up in the film. Yeah. I think everybody knows now that he doesn't have a manager, an agent. He's got this, this 1-800 number that mm-hmm. you contact. So th- they have to do the same. It's a major picture from Columbia and Sony Pictures. And it's got Woody Harrelson and you know Jesse Eisenberg in it. And so it... Do you tell a story on the podcast? You still have to track down Bill Murray. I'm going to play a little clip of it because it was Uh-oh. a long story. Because he had prepared. To, yeah, he had to go. <laughs> he had to go a long way to to get him. You know, but Woody had worked with Bill on Kingpin. Uh, Kingpin. So they originally wrote. I'll, I'll sum up up to this part where he starts talking in our clip. But he originally wrote the part for Patrick Swayze, and mm-hmm. chances are they had a huge dirty dancing bit in there. And Patrick Swayze, Swayze was supposed to be a zombie, mm-hmm. not be alive. Like they find Bill Murray alive, and it's Bill Murray. Um, and eventually he got sick, as, as we know, and then he couldn't do it. So they scoured everywhere to go. And eventually they had no luck. They were reaching out to like Jean-Claude Van Damme, who Rhett said now claims it's one of the biggest regrets of his career that he said no to it. <laughs> they tried to get The Rock and Stallone and all these different people to do this cameo in Zombieland. Never had any luck. Eventually rewrote the whole thing for just having a scene in this mansion without a celebrity cameo. And so they were all set to go on that until Woody said, well, I could call some people. Who do you got? I'm like, call Bill Murray. And they go, oh, my God, you have to call Bill Murray. <laughs> so eventually he calls back. And I think that's where Re- Rhett picks up with this story. It's just a, a minute or so. Woody sprints up to us kind of breathless. And he's he pops open his clamshell uh, cell phone to speakerphone. <laughs> and on the other end is Bill Murray. And and Bill is giving him reactions to the to the new pages and notes on what he would do with the character. So immediately, Paul and I being writers, we've got our little pads out and we're listening on speakerphone very silently So because he, he doesn't, doesn't know we're all listening. And so we're writing down the notes because Woody had no way to write them down. So, and Bill's saying stuff like, what if I were to wear golf spikes? Like, you know, and I'm thinking as he's saying this, oh my God, like he's, he might actually do this. Wow. Like we're, this, this could happen. Like, 
So after about 30 minutes of Woody and Bill just talking about the character, uh, Woody says, well, you know, kind of puts his feet to the fire, says, well, here's the thing, Bill. He said, you know, we're we're now 48 hours from shooting this. <laughs> like, it's a, it, so the question is, it's like, you know, if, if you say if you said yes, like we, we do need to hear that now and we got to get you down here and you'd make a lot of people really happy. And Bill said, um, here's the thing, Woody. He said, uh, it takes a lot to get me out of bed in the morning. <laughs> he, <laughs> said, <laughs> he said, I but love that. he said, I'll do it. <laughs> That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, gonna... but it was Bill's idea to not to be human and pretend to be a zombie. Correct. Yeah, yeah. that's mm-hmm. the change they made from the original script where Swayze was a zombie. Yeah. yeah. And it paid huge dividends. It's so great. And you, there's a clip of it or two in mm-hmm. your film. Yes. As well. Some of the great reactions from Woody Harrelson, which is this reaction I think we all have. We all have that reaction. Well, we well the Bill idea, Murray. though, is if a zombie uh, you know, thing would happen, apocalypse would happen, that's how Bill would do it. It's like he still wants to live his life. He still wants to be <laughs> right. active, so he's going to pretend to be a zombie just to get out of the house. So let's yeah. talk about that, because Karen mentioned it goes back to Razor's Edge as to a film back in the 80s that sort of proclaimed how he lives his life through a story that he loved. And wanted to make them making that film at the same time as Ghostbusters was a personal uh, project of his, and so it kind of lays out his his lifestyle and uh, Zen choices that he makes in the world. What are they in general? So I mean, because there's a great quote from him that is, "The more relaxed you are, the better you are at everything," mm-hmm. and that's something I think we forget all the time, <laughs> especially yeah. in a, in a high, a high tension workplace like entertainment, you know, whether you're acting or directing or singing or dancing or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, it's not in the movie, but it's, it's some interview. Uh, I think it was even a Q and a at Toronto for uh, Bill Murray day, but he talks about that. Uh, and I believe it was Gilda Radner who taught it to him where he said he, he learned early on, the more relaxed you are, the better you are as these sort of things. And I think, I think, Anyone who came out of that Second City uh, time when Del Close was teaching improv, they they very much had they in, take the improv off the stage and kind of live this sort of life. You know, Belushi was his roommate. Like I think they all sort of subscribed to this uh, G.I. Uh, Gurdjieff sort of philosopher, where he would um, he do these sort of stunts to wake people up. You know, to like actively have people be uh, participate in their own life. You know, he wasn't stealing someone's French fry. I think he would hit them with a stick, uh, <laughs> uh, Gurdjieff. Uh, but I think everyone in that time, even Howard Ramis was quoted to saying that it was Gurdjieff and Bill Murray were like one and the same. You know, even though Gurdjieff, I don't think him and Bill ever met. I mean, this is me just guessing because um, I don't think he... Uh, Gurdjieff's dead. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I'm more or less saying, you know? Uh, yeah. But I think there was that whole philosophy... That was kind of all one and the same, Del Close, Gurdjieff, and all that sort of stuff. That I think when a project like Razor's Edge um, and some of the stuff he was dropping into movies like uh, in Caddyshack, The Dalai Lama, I think there was this idea that he's always had. He's been, you know, doing these sort of things before he was famous. You know, um, him and his brother in New York snuck onto the Tommy bus for like I think the premiere of the of the movie or the play or something. Um, you know, I only know so much of the stuff that I needed to know for the movie. You <laughs> There's know? so much more. Yeah, yeah. there is. Yeah. I mean, Gavin Edwards wrote the um, uh, the Dow Bill Murray. Robert Schneckenberg wrote oh, the, book, the Big yeah. Bad Book of Bill Murray. There's like all this material out there, and like you just have to like kind of get it. And there's so much that you, they just don't have. Yeah, I mean, you want to live like him. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have a little fame behind you I, like you say he lived that way before he was famous but once you get the fame man you just open you yourself can really up. Yes, you can, yeah. live, you can really literally live however you want sure you can't like, steal someone's french fry when you're not famous correct but you, <laughs> they're just gonna go that guy's the best they yeah. just hit me in the face yeah but like but you can actively you know try to like this yes and approach and accept sort of these these invitations that where you if you know no ends the party certainly mm-hmm. yeah and we now we have we're, 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 he's in your movie. No, we're in your movie. I found you. Found me. We're both in your movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're. <laughs> uh, we went to the Bill Murray uh, golf tournament oh. <laughs> down in Florida. There's me. And there's Karen's uh, eyes. I'll put this up on That's the so website. <laughs> and, we should add yourselves in the IMDb. video. Yeah, uh, right. We oh, should. We totally should. Uh, now was this? This is a, a picture. I'll say for those who are just listening um, of the Bill Murray. Charity Murray Brothers Charity Golf so Tournament. To that they had for that, huh? So we yeah. went to Florida for that one year. Twenty sixteen or was it twenty fifteen? Um, it might have been two years ago. Yeah, yeah, twenty sixteen. Y- you're not in it when the camera gets pulled back on you, is it? No, no, that's not me. Okay. Not, did you just find this footage online? Yeah. That's why. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, 
No, we we were taking a cue from Bill Murray. I'm very proud of this moment. Yeah. It was 100 percent being in the moment, and being awake. So Paul is uh, he knows I'm a huge Bill Murray fan. We had Joel on the show. Paul pulled Joel aside and said for Karen's birthday or, or it was Christmas, I'd like to take and do something really cool with her because we try to do experiences more than like yes. buy stuff. That's good and, stuff to do. Yeah, and, and you get all these great memories in this kick-ass story. So Paul talked to Joel and Joel said, you know, I, you guys don't golf, but maybe we could work something out and we could get you like a party pass or something. And so uh, Paul worked that out. Joel's the best, by the way. So they he surprises me and he says, we're going to go down there. Wow, this is going to be crazy. So we get this pass. We get to go to the golfing event. We see everybody. Bill's there doing his thing. And that's really cool. But it it was like you were able to see Bill Murray in the distance, but you weren't able to interact with him. And sure. so you just kind of like, how do I talk to him? Well, I never thought what eventually happened, I couldn't even imagine in my brain. So it was a dream come true I didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. So we go to the party, and there's a guy there named Chris Mulkey, who's an actor that was in Twin Peaks. Turns out that he had been singing in a, he plays in a band, and he was at a gig one time that one of the girls in my singing group, the Boubay Sisters, had opened for him. So whenever Paul just talks to everybody, he went up to Chris Mulkey and (laughs) <laughs> he went up to Chris Mulkey and he said, "Hey, we met you one time." Real quick, the, sorry, go ahead. Is my favorite sorry, part of this. Sorry, that's my ahead. favorite part of this podcast. That's why there's so much stopping. Sorry, it was it was some tension in the wire and there was noise. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, continue with your story. <laughs> So I go up to Chris Bulky and I get introduced and we said, we've seen Leah Finkelstein opened for you. And he goes, oh, Leah Finkelstein, she's a boobay sister. And I said, I'm a boobay sister. And he goes, oh, that's cool. You want to sing with me tomorrow night? And I went, yes, I do. Yes, I will. When are we singing? And he told me the name of some song. I'd never heard of it. And I said, oh, I know that. So that night, I went on YouTube and learned this song. And there's a billion versions of it. It's this blues song. It's a call and response. I didn't know which version we were doing. but Gloria, I Gloria, right? Actually, he Bill sang Gloria later. Okay, we oh, yeah, sang, and hang on, Sloopy. That's his. Yeah, those feature. are. Double, okay, well, Chris, you sang it was uh, uh any anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got me doing what you, you want, doing baby. What, what you want me baby, to do, baby? What you want me to do, baby? What you want me to do? So Good I learned place. this thing overnight, and uh, the next day there we're in that party thing, um, and I'm standing at the edge of the stage, and Chris is up there, and he's singing. He goes, "I'm going to bring somebody up. She's going to help me out. She's with the Bubay Sisters." I get on stage and I go up there, never having sung the song ever, let alone with Chris Mulkey. And I turn around and there's Bill Murray in like the third row watching me. So we start the song and I messed it up and I wasn't sure where I was. And I didn't get nervous, though, because I was like, you know what? This is going to be the time I'm going to finally not be mad at myself for making a mistake. I'm going to stay in it and see if I can pull this off. So I just smiled. Chris started again and I started to sing it and I started to figure out that I could do it. I would be able to get through this. And Chris and I banged that thing out. Bill went crazy. I sang directly to Bill Murray and he clapped and he was just so excited for me and I was so excited and there was all these other people, but I never in my life thought I'd sing for Bill Murray. Yeah. And that was right that same night as your footage. That's awesome. I know. It was kind of crazy. So I had my own, I never got to see him after. I'm sure if I talked to him tomorrow, I'd be like, hey, Bill, I sang at your thing and then we could talk about it. But I just never saw him again. Yeah. By then. Because the other thing we took into consideration was we didn't have our phones out. We knew there would be a thousand phones. Yeah, we found somebody else. And so we were just going to enjoy this in the moment. Like, like almost taking a page from Bill, you know, and yeah. so I, I. But by the time Karen sang, I got the camera. Yeah, I filmed yeah. that because I could get Bill in the shot with yeah. uh, singing to him. You know, that's awesome. That was really cool. It was so cool. Yeah, yeah, and it made me so happy. And it also, again, it made me say, "Stop being hard on yourself. Right. You don't know this song. Yeah. It's okay." Well, I mean, that's I, I, when we did talk to a couple of different celebrities, like like Peter Fairley in the movie. Um, I don't think he's. I don't think we have it in the movie, but he said he's not afraid to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you just keep going, and eventually it works out, and then you have the greatest time. Sure, yeah. Yeah, isn't that cool? It is cool. Yeah, and so we were watching your movie, I'm like, oh my God, there we are. Uh, that's funny. But you could kind of see in Bill uh, throughout that whole thing, it was like, if people just come up to him like, selfie! Oh, like, yeah, he's like, he hates that. I'll do it, but you're not appealing to my greatest uh, desires here with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were even warned. We had a friend there who was a photographer had worked on it a couple of years in a row and he said, when you do meet Bill Murray, just don't pull your phone out and he'll stay there and ta- talk to you. Yeah. If you start doing all that, he'll politely leave. It's clear that's what happened with the, the guy in the bar at the Shangri-La, yeah. the, right? Mm-hmm. At South by Southwest in your film. Yeah. Uh, what was that his name? Travis? Was cool. Trevor. Trevor. I liked him. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, talking about just sitting at the bar talking about 
sports that the guy wasn't even interested in. He was having a yeah. beer. That yeah, the, guy got, went a long way with Bill. Yeah, we cut some of the, I mean, these stories are long. So, but the, <laughs> the, uh, when Trevor, they just started uh, bonding over music. You know, like, there's this uh, particular artist that brought him to Texas and, like, um, Trevor. And Bill's like, oh, I want to know more about that guy. Like, he was, like, legit, like, uh, uh, interested in what Trevor had to say. Yeah. I think that That's goes cool. a lot further than selfie. You yeah. Know. Oh, well, my- I mean, I, I learned a long time ago when when doing I Am Santa Claus, we had Mick Foley in the movie, which you guys had Mick Foley on your podcast. Mm-hmm. We did. Yeah. Uh, and Mick will always say, "It's like you know, you come up to me and talk about Hell in the Cell, but you're you're getting half half of my attention. Right. But if you come and talk about Tori Amos, uh, Christmas, and you have a, you have a new best friend. You know, I I did a small part on a TV show called No Ordinary Family." Uh, on ABC and had Michael Chiklis and they sat me right down next to Michael Chiklis so I'm like All right, I'm sitting right next to him waiting for a scene to start I know if I go love you in the shield oh my God, it's okay not gonna get anywhere but I said this guy's a Red Sox fan I'm an Angels fan one thing we can bond on is how much the Yankees suck and I brought that up and we talked for 15 minutes oh, <laughs> about yeah. baseball you know yeah. and it was great too and it wasn't even like I felt like I was I knew I was fishing at the top to have something to talk about, but once you get into it with him, sure, piece of cake. You know, when, yeah. chat. when we were in Chicago, uh, Bill was doing a book signing for Cinderella Story. Okay, and I did you read that? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, I well, was. I, I, oh, I started to. Uh, I didn't finish it. It was, oh. it was a difficult read for me. I, I, oh, really? I couldn't follow along. <laughs> a lot of golf. A yeah. lot of golf. A lot of golf. Yeah. Unabashedly golfy. Yeah. I wasn't just like testing your reading skills. You no, know? <laughs> it was. It was one of those. Did you read that? Did you finish <laughs> it? Get through all the words. Yeah, I got through it. I felt it was a thin book, which I was happy about. Yeah. yeah. I haven't gotten all the way through the Dow of Bill Murray, though. I did. Yeah, I've yeah. gotten like three quarters. I'm still, I was looking at it in my bedroom. I was well, like, then you picked up that. Springsteen's documentary, and that's right, a beast, that's but good. really good. But, oh, his book. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah well, I'm sorry, not documentary, his biography. Yeah, biography. Yeah, autobiography. Well, it's so funny. If you get these things on Audible, you know, normally it's eight, nine hours. I think his is like 12 hours. <laughs> you know, maybe more. Yeah, he's got his own pace, you know. <laughs> well, and then God, I just downloaded, because uh, oh, I'm a big Audible guy. Um, Infinite Jest, and that's like two days of audio. Wow. I'm going to check it real quick. You could, you could Oh, talking. what I want to tell you is that when you guys are talking about you meet people and they'll, uh, if you talk to them about something personal, they'll actually talk to you. So I was meeting Bill Murray in the book signing, and I had already written what I wanted him to sign off on because it was going so fast. I didn't want to waste any time with, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, they, you know, there's they'll rush you through the line. So I wrote, you're the best in your row, love, and I left a space. So I handed it to Bill and he goes, I'll sign off on that. And then uh, he goes, so he just said something like, so so how are you? And I told him my Ghostbuster story very quickly, very truncated. And he stopped me and checked in to see how my dad was and to tell my dad he hoped he was doing better. And, and it was really, you know, that's really great. And he's glad that he could help and, and the family at that time. And he slowed it all down and said, how is your dad? Mm-hmm. Very cool. That was very cool. 56 hours. Woo! 56 hours is Infinite Who's Jest. Who's that? Who, what, who is that? Infinite I, Jest? Yeah. Um, oh, God. I, 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 the is it a, the time. It's, um, I'm mad at myself for not knowing this. David Foster Wallace. Oh, uh, that's right. I yeah. knew I heard that name because I saw the film about him. The, uh, with uh, Yeah, good movie. Yeah. With Jason oh, Segel. I guess I don't know who that is. He's a young author. Died too soon, right? Yeah, he killed oh. Himself. He killed himself. Oh. So. Well, then that's, that's definitely too soon then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he had two or three like huge things and then faded out which is a shame but um, speaking of your other film uh, my, uh, I Am Santa Claus it is the time of year when people should watch it again so not only yes. should you watch Bill Murray yes. stories which is available where I know you did uh, screenings yeah the Bill Murray stories right now is on iTunes for digital well, anywhere digital downloads can be downloaded uh, and then the, the DVD and Blu-ray and the, the Blu-ray is uh, and DVD I guess um, have uh, you know extended interviews with uh, Joel Murray uh, Peter Fairley some deleted scenes a story about making the movie um, so it's good stuff. That's cool. And yeah. there's still screenings if you want to go in the theater. I looked at your website. Yeah. There's a few of them. They're scattered all over the country yeah. and Canada. Yeah, we're uh, playing well. Canada. Well, I don't know when you're putting this up, but uh, when this particular time, November 2nd, I think it is. Oh, yeah, that's today. Uh, uh, <laughs> this will go up probably the 5th. Okay, yeah. Well, we're playing Canada. I think there's in Ohio. Yeah. Just what, the Bill the Murray stories. The Bill Murray stories dot com. Okay, you didn't do the Bill Murray stories life lessons learned from a mythical no. man dot com. No. Okay, good, no, no. probably best. <laughs> um, but see, I am Santa Claus as well. Wherever you can, yeah, that's get on your Amazon on Prime, that. and then you know wherever you can buy DVDs or Blu Ray. Yeah, because there's another example of really good subjects, like the four people uh, who yeah. are profiled in that movie as real beard Santas, are all diverse and all. So interesting, <laughs> and all, for various and different ways. Some guys are just fascinating. You talk to other guys, you just want to look at and go, 
wow. <laughs> so, and of course, Mick Foley's in there and loves Christmas so much that yeah. it, ultimately the film becomes just positive and refreshingly um, optimistic about Christmas. Yeah, what's interesting about uh, Santa Claus in, in general, he's this magical person that walks into your life and makes this memory and this leaves. Oh. And it's a really good uh, transition to the Bill Murray there story. You go. Right. Well done. Mm -hmm. You like that? Yeah, it's almost like I practiced that one. An, you don't know, like pitching. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, funny. We we do um, a meditation app after we work yeah. out, and uh, we do um, Headspace. Headspace. Okay, have you done that one? No. It, well, the 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 chapters that we're in right now, it was perfect timing for this movie because it's talking about the dreamlike state that you are in, and the life is a dream. Life mm -hmm. is but a dream, and it goes back to this whole Bill Murray idea that. You, it just doesn't matter. Right. So things, you don't have to get so wound up in them because they will eventually work themselves out and go away anyway. And so if, instead of getting and leaning into what isn't working, to pull back and let it kind of all become there, but not to focus on the things that aren't working. Just try to say it's going to work out. It just doesn't matter. And to treat it more like a dream. You're then, not supposed to judge certain things. You know, right. it's good or bad. Bad things lead to good, good things. Bad, I love know. the story you have in there about the guy with the horse. Yeah. That was great. There's a, a little uh, story that teaches you about this concept. I love that, but I won't give it away. Yeah. Well, I mean, we spoke to uh, a cool. TNN, uh, TNN, uh, CNN, uh, uh, the Journalist. Nashville Network. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I'm sorry. laughs> uh, 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 David Allen, uh, and he has his wisdom project where he's, you know, what can be learned from movies. Uh, so he talks about some some of that stuff, and the the story he tells is it's like I don't want to say uh, like a common wise tale, but it's the thing that other you know it's a common or like it's a popular sort of anecdote. And uh, when we were editing it, like um, a big fan of Last Man on Earth, and one of the episodes they used that in there. I was like, oh my god, this is everywhere because <laughs> cool. I'd never heard of it until David said it to me. You know. That's wow. the first time That's I've heard cool. of yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I loved it. It's, yeah. it's great. And I like yeah. how it could just go on and on. Yeah. The story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because whatever is going to happen is going to happen anyway. That's the thing we all have to remember. Well, it's it's in our human nature to judge these things, right. you know, and, you know, uh, good things not. It was it matter. Was like, it matter? It, how so, do we know yeah. what's good or bad? Yeah. I, I personally feel like, you know, a lot of things, I mean, most things don't mean anything. It's what we assign it to. Like, right. It's what we are like, okay, well, this happened. I'm going to put my own story on it, my own twist on it, or my own feeling to it, and that's how it matters. And if you are going to do that, you might as well find the best in everything yeah. because you're going to be making it up yourself anyway. Yeah. So even if something it doesn't seem to be going right, then just decide it's okay because you're the one who decides. Well, I'm always fascinated too. Like if, if something were to happen, like if someone were to trip in the park, you know, and like three different people saw it. You know, you're going to see different people's like versions of that. You know, there's never going to be there's no such thing really as a, like a true fact in that sense because it's like it's always opinion on how you see, you know, politics, religion, all that sort of stuff. It's right. always your point of view and how you were raised. A lot yeah. of it before you had even a choice. Yeah, and I think it's fascinating when like if like one person gave a speech, you're going to have like a million different people interpreting it all different ways, and it's right. it's, it's 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 interesting to me. Yeah. I'm sorry, go on. I love this stuff. <laughs> and I, I've, oh, oh, I have one last thing. Sorry, that was your I, favorite part. I wanted to do it again. <laughs> Please go on. Uh, another thing I do, I'm wearing my Bill Murray shirt, which is my favorite shirt. I just love it. But um, whenever I go to a situation where I don't know anybody, if I go to a party or if I'm going to a meeting or if I'm going to anywhere where I'm going to be around people I don't know and I need to suss out what we're doing right away, <laughs> I wear this shirt because... Either people love Bill Murray, they've heard of Bill Murray, or they don't know who he is. Usually they don't say, I hate Bill Murray. So right away- There's people who don't know who Bill Murray is? Yeah. And I find them, and I immediately dismiss them. <laughs> and I'm done with those people, and it makes it a lot faster. But the people that love Bill Murray, we immediately hit it off, we're fine, we're good. But the people that come up and are like, is that George Washington on your ah, shirt? Really? Just happened about a week and a half ago. I just go- we're good. I can. Move I can see on. them can going. Let you go now. I can see them going. Is that Tom Hanks? Because of the whole crying baby photo. Right. No. No. This is George you, you Washington. What I'm talking about. No, I don't. So there's a crying baby photo where um, uh, Bill Murray is in St. Andrews, and there's a baby crying next. He's to him. all in orange. It yeah. was in the movie. And he just the baby cry he crying. Just, he just stands up and starts crying next to him. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. And okay. Yeah. Very viral, famous because of Bill Murray and all that stuff. And then years later, it came out. They're like, "Is that Tom Hanks or is that Bill Murray?" Oh my so god. So much Lord. so that like it was a British show. Oh. Or they had Tom Hanks. He goes, "It's not me." <laughs> like I know because I didn't take the picture, and they recreated the Why picture. Would it look like Tom Hanks. I mean, you honestly, you look at the picture. You, I could see it. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. that's hysterical. Yeah, 
Yeah, white men in their 60s, I guess. I guess. <laughs> it's maybe all I could put t- together. <laughs> Look at the picture and then think of all something. Right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Homework uh, for all the listeners. Thank there you. you. Or, and, of course, <laughs> and watch the film. Oh, right. you, oh, if you're doing this, you can just throw the pictures on there. I could. That's right. Yeah, I will. We will. Look at that. Yep. Um, Taking charge. So I'm telling you, I have this great Bill Murray can crash here poster. I, I have to find it. it. Son of a We'll bitch. put the picture up of that, too. Yeah. There's a lot of pictures we'll be putting up. <laughs> uh, so two more quick questions we ask everyone who comes on Oh, yeah. This will be great. Um, we're almost done. I know. It goes really fast. Okay. Nice. Uh, if we uh, no time to eat. If you, <laughs> what would you say uh, if I asked you? You know, I don't even like the pitch, but what have you seen lately? Anything? Talk. Let's get outside of our movies and uh, to some that are what out have there. I seen lately? I saw Halloween. I really enjoyed that. I like the director, but I haven't gone out to see it yet. I kind of yeah. feel like I need to see the first one again. I've, it's been so long. Yeah, not really. I mean, like, no. I no? don't think. I don't think. I don't no? think you do. Yeah. But I mean, no. The director's fantastic. Um, yeah, David Gordon Green. Thank you. Love yeah. him. Uh, but I feel like like uh, Halloween or horror movies in general are things you really need to watch in a theater, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's why I purposely watched that. I watched uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Three mm-hmm. Identical Strangers, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, I haven't seen that one yet. Let me see that. And I, my, I'm itching to see uh, Mid-90s. Uh, me too. I almost yeah. went the other day. I went to see Beautiful Boy, which was there. Right. Okay. But I really want to see Mid-90s. You mean with Steve Carell? With Steve Carell, the great Steve Carell. Uh, For all I was your audio listeners, I am wearing a Steve Carell t-shirt. Yes, you are. He was, uh, man, he was so good in Battle of the Sexes. Did you see that from last year? Yes, I oh did. God, I saw it on the plane. Uh, so good. It's so much so I watched like three fourths of it on the uh, plane, like the ride there, and then like on the way, like I was like flying somewhere else in a couple of weeks, and I was like, oh, I'll get up. Yeah, it hardly <laughs> even got to, <laughs> to the match. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It hardly even got to the match by that yeah. point. Um, and of course, we ask everybody this who comes on the show, what is your favorite movie of all time? So you told me to 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 do that, right? But right. I, I don't have a uh, nobody does. <laughs> nobody all right? does. So would, it, would I have? A would, could anyone follow the rule? No, no. impossible. Nobody and, does. And we, let, and we let the rule be broken. <laughs> there you got. <laughs> Um, but so my thought is, uh, I feel you can judge a lot uh, by someone's top five. Um, and my particular top five, and I'll wait, add- let me just interrupt for that before you get to it because it kind of goes to Karen's thing. I kind of don't like all these movies going digital because we used to go into someone's house, see the DVD collection, and immediately make a judgment about yeah. it. You yeah. know, I'd be like, you could I get like an this idea. person? I said, yeah. what do they got here? Oh, no country for a minute. I'm with you. I'm, I'm a broadcast a, news and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right, we can talk, you know, but it's like. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm, but I'm, yeah, I'm but if it was all Apple Pie movies. America Pie. America Pie, I'd be yeah, like, hmm. I don't know. I I like American Pie movies. Uh, well, I do the like one, Eugene the ones, Levy. The ones with the people. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the ones that get going further and further what away from the original. What if it's just the band camp uh, made for... Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or uh, Naked Mile, I think. Yeah, one. yeah. yeah I know. Um, but American Pie 2 is really good. Yeah, they're all right. Yeah. Uh, better than the first. Okay. Uh, anyway, oh. um, so my top five <laughs> movies, and I feel like you can judge a lot by his own top five. Uh, Ghostbusters is obviously on there. All right. Good. Um, uh, American Beauty. Oh, yeah. All right. SLC Punk. Mm, I've never seen that, believe mm-hmm. it or not. My Cousin Vinny. Oh, I love My Cousin Vinny. My Cousin Vinny. Wow. That's a great and movie. Billy Madison. Wow. Oh. So you didn't go like uh, Babette's Feast. You were like... <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Le Revoir, <laughs> Le Revoir, <laughs> Le Revoir <laughs> Les Enfants it's from Louis Mal. It's usually the Oscar winner. Yeah. He went like yeah. Billy Madison. Well, well, well what's his face? Uh, uh, American Beauty is an Oscar winner. That it one is, is yeah. 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 And uh, I love how I actually love how yeah. non pretentious. Yeah, because yeah. they but best actress, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I only know that because of Seinfeld. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. That's a good place to reference from too. Yeah. I can so, what are you guys uh, top five? I think I just actually just named it. My favorite is uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. If you went five in, I think two and three are No Country for Old Men and Broadcast News. If you kept going, you'd find like The Princess Bride in there, Doctor Strange Love. I, I haven't ranked them beyond like the top three. Okay. But so you're, you're like, you're like clinic, and of course, clinical like like tops like the the ones that you would see at like film school and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, kind of. I wish yeah. they'd show broadcast news in film school. Okay. I don't know if they do, but um, I'm blanking on broadcast news. Which one oh, is that? James L. Brooks oh, with it, Albert Brooks, William Hurt, and Holly. And it was Hunter. basically it was foreshadowing what's going on now, where news is about personality instead of about fact. Yeah, okay. Style over substance in 1987. Okay. So James L. Brooks saw this. So I used comment. to work in a video store because I'm a huge Kevin Smith fan, uh, and I, I remember seeing that cover or mm-hmm. the box. Uh, but I don't think I've ever oh, really dive in. smart. It's so really good. Smart. And it's also. Talk radio made me think of it too because that's like another one of those sort of like, just like, uh, I guess, 80s, 90s sort of movies were really dark. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That was like 89. It was Oliver Stone. Yeah. Post Platoon. Yeah. Real uh, dark and angry. Yeah. I uh, loved it stuff. because like they were smoking and doing radio. Like I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. that's true. That's a time capsule. <laughs> yeah. Alec Baldwin, tons of good people in that yeah. movie. Yeah. That was good. Um, Yours? Oh, all right. Uh, so Ghostbusters, of course. And then um, I'm right up there with Notting Hill and Love Actually and Bridget Jones. But 
I also love What About Bob and Stuart Saves His Family. Really? I love that show. Hal Ramis. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Okay. Dead yeah. Shot Donnie. It's, it's, a, it's one of the movies I watch every Thanksgiving. I was going to say, it's the a, time is coming, coming to watch it. It's coming to watch again. it, yeah. Well, me and my wife, after every Thanksgiving that Friday, we'll, uh, we'll have John Hughes Day. Yeah, you have to watch yeah. Planes, Trains. So we just else. pick, like, you know, yeah. depending on how long the day goes, mm-hmm. uh, we dedicate for movies. Uh, we'll pick, like, two to possibly three of each. You know, like, she'll pick two, I'll pick two, and, you know, Trains, Planes, Alma is always on there. Uncle Buck. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Uncle always a big fan. Buck. Yeah. Oh, I love John Candy. Yeah. The, the, it always kills me. When John I, Candy used to get behind a bar. Joel Murray told oh, us yeah? a, a great story about. It. He's like that was that was John Candy's bit. That was his move is just to pour you stuff. Yeah, he goes. He goes uh, uh, behind the bar. They can't get to you. Uh, <laughs> them. Them. <laughs> and they they are worse than ever now. Back in his you know, but yeah. he died in ninety four. He doesn't even know the social media. Uh, them that now has been created that that you have to, to hide you. from. Good Lord. I, I love that move uh, in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. It always, always, always kills me. And it just makes me cry the minute I see it when he goes, my wife likes me. I like I, I me. I like me. My wife likes me. And I lose my shit. I love when uh, he's Steve Martin sees him in the airplane and there's a recreation of the cab, but yeah. it's still it's at the door. Just the, the airplane. door. Yeah. yeah, just the door. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives that look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just Wait, can you, can you do that to the... <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for the love of God, when this is over, if you haven't seen Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, oh, go watch yeah. that. My oh. God, this is that's too another funny. great movie. Yeah. yeah, I love the '80s for movies. I know it, '80s get flack for a lot of stuff, but '87 was my favorite year. I mean, look at that year: The Big Easy, totally underrated; Prin- uh, Princess Bride, The Untouchables, Lethal Weapon, Raising Arizona, uh, Broadcast News, and I mean, it just goes on and on. Are you Moonstruck? A fa- are you I mean, a fan of bro- uh, Broadcast News? Slightly. A okay. Bit. I'm just, just making sure. I lo- he Albert loves Brooks, Holly Hunter. Albert Brooks, Albert one of my Brooks. favorite movies. One of my favorite people ever. Yeah. If you have, if you're underversed on the Albert Brooks catalog of movies, get versed. So, uh, our executive producer for the Bill Murray stories, Life Lessons Learned by a Mythical Man, uh, is uh, Glenn Zipper. Uh, he's done plenty of documentaries, uh, one of which won the Academy Award uh, producing. Um, but he told me, uh, I need to watch Defending Your Life. And I did, and I loved it. Oh, yeah, it's a great yes. movie. And I, for what particular re- no particular reason at all, I just never really watched any Albert Brooks movies, you know? But that one, and I was like, ooh, that's good. All right, next up for you. Watch uh, Lost in America, Lost then in watch America. Real Life. Those yeah. three. Forget, I mean, Real Life was reality TV 30 years before there was reality TV. Yeah. yeah. Uh, brilliant. And uh, I'll leave with this note. Kudos to you and your films uh, because they look like movies. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Reality, people, some people love to blur reality TV and documentaries. Like, reality TV is not documentary. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. And you are making documentaries. So good for you. Good so for you. Like, like, can I dissect this real quick? So like when yeah. you say it look like real movies, like uh, the interviews are shot well or the editing, like what do you, or the, that confessional sort of reality? Well, a couple of things. About that, first of all, we've watched a lot of movies. I just like hearing good things about yeah. myself. Okay? <laughs> we'll be specific. <laughs> no, we've, we've watched a lot of indie movies because a lot of times it's indie people who can come on our show. You know, I would love to get Matt Damon on here. This hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. But someone make an indie film, they'll come on and they'll talk about it. Josh Hellman was recently on. If you may not know who he is, but he played, he's been in a ton of stuff like Jack Reacher and Fury Road, but he played young Stryker in the X Men movies. Okay. Uh, the young Brian Cox. And so he came on and we had to watch his film. It was great. It was and great. it was so refreshing. It, and it was, was great, great because they're not always. Yeah, but we always <laughs> you know? find things that we like about it because the idea of people being able to make something that's in their mind become a reality is great. There's just different technical elements of that, but when you see one that looks like a movie, you immediately know it, and it's obviously easy lights and sound. You want to mm. make sure that is very <laughs> solid, but also being able to tell a story in a way that you don't get in the way of the what the story is about. Um, there's some documentaries that just become about the person doing the yes. documentary. Yeah, well, that was very difficult because mm-hmm. I didn't, I don't want to be in the documentaries. But right. we, we felt like that was the only way to kind of tell the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Santa Claus, I'm not in. The next right. movie I'm doing, I'm not in. Uh, on purpose, you know, I like, and I, you know, like yourselves, like you are saying, like, I went out to watch some of the bad ones. You know, like, I was like, okay, well, let's learn not what, to, like, what's not to do. You know, right. you just mm-hmm. watch them and go, I don't like that. That made me feel extremely uncomfortable. Don't do that. You know, and uh, all that sort of stuff. But let me ask you, though. Uh, in a doc, all talking heads can be awful, too. Yeah, that can be bad, too. Yeah. yeah. Be yeah it's, and, it's, there's, I mean, yeah. there's so many so many ways to make a bad documentary, you know, yeah. and you just try not to. You know, uh, I mean, I don't think anyone's like, you know what? 
<laughs> There's enough good movies out there. I'm gonna I'm make making a bad... my mark a different way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, did the uh, this we have a three minute scripted opening in that? Did you guys? What did you like that part? You could be honest. No, I, I, I it wasn't my favorite part. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought actually the real people were more engaging. But yes. I get how you're luring people into what you're doing. Yeah. Well, without... there's a lot of people that might not know about the Bill Murray stories. Yeah. So that you have to well, somehow talk I mean, yeah. to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was our, our thought process was like, okay, well, the, let's show them in the wild. Let's mm-hmm. show them being yeah, told. You, you create yeah. it as legend. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. then we know what we're dealing with. Yeah. Right. And being that we already know the stories, we go, oh, okay, let's get to the people. Right. But the fact that you went and met the people was so, I didn't see that coming. I loved that. I, I almost wish there was a way you could have talked to the lady and went to the ball game with him. I just loved that normal lady. There was something special about the fact that he would just look over, as a woman, uh, just t- to have him not pick the most beautiful, blonde, tall, skinny girl you've ever seen. Because we're all used to that being the girl that guys pay attention to. And the fact that he would turn to a lady who looked like every lady I know and say, hey, come sit down here and watch them. He gave her World Series tickets. my gosh. That just makes all regular women feel so much like that's amazing because that does not happen. (laughs) Usually it's the really hot chick and that's fine and that's what we expect. But that was so cool. Yeah. And then you come on after the opening, the scripted Mm -hmm. opening, and we wonder if we're going to follow you. But then you even wisely, about 15 minutes into you being on screen, go, look, this isn't about me meeting Bill Murray. This is about these stories. And then you pick up as filmmaker and go explore. Yeah. There's movies like that that are good. Like my date with Drew. Like the mission statement there is I'm this guy. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna try to get a date with Drew Barrymore, so that the whole movie you're going. Will he get this date with Drew? You know, like our idea. Right after that scripted opening, we show a picture of me and Bill. We rip that band aid right off. We're like, this is not that movie. Like we are. Right. Th- like right. I don't want you to think. Will I get Bill? You know, like here's a picture with me and Bill. There you go. Let's actually now focus on the the good things. These right. Bill Murray stories. You know, that was. And coming from where we were, having been to that. Uh, golf tournament and seeing that when people just surround him with the hey can I take a picture and, st- and I have no moment with him whatsoever yeah, he's, we not have, we have, <laughs> he's not we a have fan. we I danced with him I t- stood next to him we clapped we enjoyed I sang to him I have no pictures with him mm-hmm. but that's okay yeah, but you have that video. I right? do, yeah, yeah, I do have a yeah, video. Yeah, because everybody else in the world because they all <laughs> filmed it. Hours worth <laughs> yeah. of footage. It was weird because we walked away from that after from that whole weekend and we were like we have no pictures with Bill Murray, but he was right there just like you are. But we were all enjoying the band together. And then we were right in the front. So when he was doing um, all of the different songs, uh, Sloopy, Sloopy yeah. he would take the mic and stick it right in our face and we'd sing with him. But we didn't take a picture of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so I, I battle this. It's like I, I love uh, just, you know, being able to be present in the moment and go, OK, well, I'm experiencing this. The experience is what I'll remember. I don't need a picture. But there's that documentary side of me that goes, I really want this picture yeah. just to back up. <laughs> like, not to back yeah. up or prove, but just to, like go, okay, well, this is a quick, like, like a, a punch in the face. You know, it's like, okay, I remember this. Like, this picture will bring me back to that moment, you know? Yeah. So you go back and forth with all that It's stuff. storytelling, too. You want to be able to tell this story with many different ways. No, I mean, action. just in personal life. Oh, just in personal <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I just, you know, like, because, like, there's plenty of times where, like, I'll, I'll meet someone and I'm like, you know what? I don't want to ruin this with a picture, but at the end, like, you're like, I want to take this picture so I could easily just drop into that memory. Yeah. You know? It's weird. I have a picture of a hair of, um... Oh, my God. What's his name? Uh, whenever we met him, I told him the story about my dad, and he started to cry. Ernie Hudson. Yeah. <laughs> I started to tell Ernie Hudson about my dad, and uh, he started to cry, and I started to cry, and then we were hugging and crying, and Paul and his wife were standing next to each other going, oh, well, there we go. <laughs> I told <laughs> Ernie Hudson. Oh, she's telling the story. <laughs> and then Ernie about Hudson and I are just a mess, uh-huh. and then Paul's like, can I get a picture? So I have not only a picture of Ernie Hudson and I, but we are completely puffy and all <laughs> cryy. And it's just the most ridiculous picture because he's just like, oh, it was awesome. I'll do a quick one, then we'll head out, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I can yeah. feel, I feel the need. Like uh, you guys probably have dinner ready or something. Oh, God, time limit no. on this. No, we, no, no. I mean, to twist our arm. Talk about Bill Murray. I could yeah. talk to you all night um, about Bill but Murray. But yeah, so, um, so I was in, I was in New York. So my buddy uh, goes by the nickname Twitchells. He has Tourette's. Uh, he was a comedian. Is he a sounds amazing. And he was booked uh, to be on the Montel Williams show. It was like the last oh, cool. of the last couple episodes or something like that. Um, we were living in New Jersey. Uh, and we were both different houses living in New Jersey. He was like, hey, I'm going to be on this Montel Williams show. Do you want to come with me? I was like, sure. Uh, so we took the train. I had a car for us. We got to the, the, the studio. Um, 
and they tell him like, look, uh, you may not have the chance to be on. Like we, there's all these different things. We may not get to you, but please hang Do you want to hang out in the backstage? Do you want to be on the thing? Uh, he's like, I'm going to hang out backstage. I went right for the crowd. Cause I just, I just think it's, it's ridiculous programming. Um, <laughs> and so I came back up, said, this is, this is fantastic. Cause I was love just being in this like sea of Montel fans. Mm-hmm. Um, and Lou was like, I'm not really fighting with the people, but he was like, I came all this way. Can I at least meet Montel? And they're like, you know, he shoots three episodes a day. He's exhausted. He's going to go home to his family. We're very, very sorry. But there's nothing we can do. And he's just upset about it. Um, so we, me and him were waiting for the elevator in New York. And this is like, it's a studio, super, super small. We're getting in the elevator and then Montel comes right into the elevator. And I'm talking, this is a really, really, really small New York studio <laughs> elevator. And the door's shut. It's me, Twitchells, and Montel Williams. And Lou goes right into it. You know, I have this, I have Tourette's. I'm supposed to be on the show. Uh, and they start talking about medical marijuana in some sense, right? And it was the long, it's two, two, three floors, the longest <laughs> uh, <laughs> elevator ride of my life. Uh, and they just start bonding because, you know, Montel uses me- medical marijuana for his issues. And Lou was using MS or something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Twitchell's for Tourette's was using for his. So they just had this bonding session and they just start hugging each other and crying. Oh. And like I, I've been there. and like I'm not good with my own emotions, oh. let alone uh, uh, my my friend and this TV star. Uh, and so I'm like in the corner as much <laughs> as I possibly can. And uh, they the elevator opens. They they wipe their tears. I ask for a photo. It's the best photo because he's puffy and I'm completely yes! normal. Yes. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, he asked uh, Lou if he wanted to smoke. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, so it was a very funny. And I the, the reason I asked for that photo is because it was so ridiculous. Yeah. I needed. I wanted that photo to go. All right. Well, I'm right back in this moment. You know. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so we never cool. got a Catherine O'Hara photo. No, I did that to Catherine O'Hara too. My mom had passed away. She was fighting pa- uh, pancreatic cancer, and so she would. I would go and be with her, and, and it was hard for her to watch anything for too long because she was doing all this chemo and stuff. So I went back home and I brought all the SCTV shows oh. because those sketches are so short and so funny that I was able to, like, we'd be able to watch a couple before my mom would get sick again. And so we spent all this time doing that. And then after she passed, I was in a Target, and Paul goes, I think it's Catherine O'Hara. And I just drop my shit, and I'm like, I must speak with her. And I go over, I'm like, hello, Catherine O'Hara, my name's Karen, and I just wanted to say thank you. And I just started telling the story, and she was with her sister. So again, I I am in, like, the, I'm holding the coats or whatever with the sister. We're just kind of sitting there watching them both cry. Catherine and I are crying and hugging, and I'm thanking her for the comedy and how it made my mom happy. And she's like, I'm so happy to hear that because that's what we do it for. It was amazing, and we were a mess. So on the flip side of that, <laughs> right? Yeah. So my my second cousin is Frankie Avalon, who's like oh, the, cool. the the Venus. Is that right? You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we and, cover some of his songs. Yes. Um. So I was me and my wife uh, had uh, I guess lunch with him, uh, and it was right around the time Annette passed away, uh, and this lady comes over and was like, like. Frankie, you and Annette meant so much to me. And they're just, just like crying and all that stuff. And it's uh, it's awkward. <laughs> yeah. To be the person just watching yeah, this happen. It's like, it's like another time like I'm just stuck That's in a funny. situation where people are crying and I'm yeah. just like, I don't I don't know what to do. I have one more. Okay. I'm not telling you not to do no, it to other people. I but have I'm just one saying, more. As, as a uh, relative of the person watching it happen, it was, it was really uncomfortable. Uh, poor Catherine Harris' sister. It. Like I said, I've gotten... I'm the it's your fault though. Paul took holder. me... Paul always sets me up for these things that are very important to me. So he took me to see uh, a screening of Snatched, and he knew Paul Feig was be there. Oh. And so Paul Feig spoke afterwards, and we were down front, and people were taking pictures and doing whatnot. And Wait, what I, movie did you see? Snatched. He, he produced was a producer that. of that. Really? Mm-hmm. It was him and Jonathan Levine, I think, directed it, and the two of them had a Q&A. Paul Feig? Yeah. Yeah. I cool? didn't even think the Freaks and Geeks were you know, at that time. No, Snatched was oh, the recent sorry. Goldie Hawn and Amy Schumer. The recent one, movie. yeah. Oh. You think it's wrapped? Brad, no, I'm the... thinking Brad Pitt, right? <laughs> That's Snatch. That's oh. Guy Ritchie. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, yeah. is easy. Snatched <laughs> is comedy. <laughs> Goldie Hawn and Amy Schumer go to South no, America. This is all very weird. Oh, okay, now yeah. I know, I know. This is a totally weird story if you're thinking it's that Brad Pitt Yeah, I was like, Brad Pitt, what? Paul Feig produced a tough gang movie in like rural Britain? Before he was famous? What? How did he do it? So Paul Feig, and I was there at the screening. It's crazy. No. So Paul Feig was up there doing his thing, signing stuff, being really cool. Paul Preston, my husband, 
goes up to him and I didn't know Paul was going to do this. And I get shy and I don't want to like bother people. And I didn't know this would affect me the way it did. But Paul Preston goes, hey, Paul, I really liked your movie. I'd like you to introduce you to somebody that I think really would like to meet you. And he said something like that. And he goes, this is my wife, Karen. And I was, I got to cat and I look around and Karen's going, I <laughs> because I wanted to say to him, thank you for Ghostbusters 2016. It really meant a lot to see women Ghostbusters because I wanted to be a Ghostbuster, but as a woman, you just see dudes. But I finally felt like I could be a Ghostbuster. And of course, that's what I wanted to say. That was very coherent. That's not how it went, though. <laughs> what I said was, thank you for the go. And then I started crying. <laughs> and then he started hugging me and he kissed me on the head. And then we took a picture and I'm a sloppy mess. And then I posted on Twitter and then he wrote back and he um, liked it and he thanked me. Yeah, he said it was for, one of the highlight of his name. Uh, yeah. yeah. How many celebrities would you say you cried in front of? Just the ones I mentioned. The rest I don't think so I three. have. Yeah. So three. Yeah, yeah. I, I usually can handle That'd be a whole other pod- <laughs> podcast if it was more than that. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you the really important ones because they're all Ghostbuster related. I'm just picturing this like movie montage of just you breaking down in front of people. <laughs> and I didn't see that one coming. That one snuck up on me because I didn't think of it until I started talking to him about comedy and women and comedy and then I lost my mind. Yeah, because I know yeah. you particularly like the fact that <gasps> the, just... the Ghostbusters in the 2016 version aren't doing it for a man. No, nope. they don't care how they look. They don't care. They're they just don't. women doing stuff like the first guys did. They yeah. gotta come together in order for any of them to succeed. Which I fight. loved about that because yeah. it's together. They're stronger. They're just regular people working at the top of their intelligence. All that stuff came full circle. Only they're women. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, how about this? What do we got? <laughs> oh, that's not happening. That's not I'm like, what is we're supposed that? to hear this. All right, that's the end of the show. Oh, sure. I brought it with That down. wraps another TMG <laughs> uh, interview, everybody. Follow us on Twitter uh, at The Movie Guys, uh, Facebook.com slash The Movie Guys, as well as YouTube, iTunes, Instagram, all that nonsense for daily jokes, articles, media links, and more. Thanks to Tommy Avalone. Hey! You're welcome. Italian name, right? Of yeah. course. What, what you're part related of Italy does it go back to? I have no idea. No oh, idea. Oh, yeah. We went to uh, Sicily. South Jersey. South Jersey, Italy. You know. You know, water. Were you an actor at first? <laughs> no. I just, I just, my IMDb just for some reason has actor stuff. I just put myself in all the movies that I produce. Oh. It just says, like, why wouldn't you? This is this guy who eventually yells, whoa, decaf guy. <laughs> it's, it's all there. I love the, the, the naked gun where it, the credit would be the thing they said in the movie if it's only one line. Yeah. Hey, That's it's a Rico awesome. Palazzo. That'd be and the, the guy's name. And then there'd be like recipes for certain foods <laughs> there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, oh, give me social for the film. What are the other, um, is there Twitter? Yeah, if you, well, if you go to the BillMurrayStories.com, there's our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Because uh, they're different for each one. Twitter, you couldn't do certain things. But we made sure not to have like uh, BM stories because that's a whole completely different movie. Really? Bowel oh. movement. Oh, oh, well, that's unfortunate. Get it? Boom. Where's wow. your sound effects? Where's your yeah, sound effects? I got, I'm on to the music now. I'm on to the music. <laughs> God. Uh, and you can find out everything we're up oh to here, God. at the, uh, including reviews, articles, and uh, more interviews at themovieguys.net. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. Bill Murray Stories. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. I'm having some it just of doesn't talking. matter.